Welcome to the Mentored Engineer. In this video, we're going to talk about failure I'm having on my roller coaster. And it happened all of a sudden, so it's kind of an interesting case study here. So what's going on is I'm actually having some of my rollback preventers split in half. Uh, right in half, here we go, we got this one right here. And this one completely split in half. And these are the devices that as you're on the lift hill, um, you go up and it moves out of the way of the cart. And then it comes back and prevents the train from uh, falling back if it, uh, you know, something goes wrong. And luckily we haven't had to use those a couple times just because of uh, human error. Uh, but other than that, it's been working great. But all of a sudden these two split right in half. So let's take a look into why exactly those are happening. What we first need to do is find out what's going on with our loading. So we always want to start there. So this thing right here gets hit as it's coming up. Uh, and you can see the mark, it's near, but not on where it started splitting. And then as it comes back, it will hit there. So if this you know, got hit pretty hard, uh, it's gonna have a, a great load here. It's gonna react by the rail tie there and then the pivot down below. All right, so it's gonna be in a sense from here up a cantilevered beam and it's gonna have a load on it uh, right about there, about two inches, maybe three inches from the rail tie so a very short beam okay so if we look at any bending situation and I've simulated it with these two uh, pieces of wood right here uh, as I bend these uh, they're actually gonna flex so the top one is is gonna have a curvature like this if I bend it down and the bottom one also the same curvature so I'd end up with a shorter segment on the bottom than on the top which means the two are rubbing uh, against each other so what wants them to slide against each other is something called transverse shear, and that exists in every beam. However, there are many cases, in fact, most cases, where we just ignore it because it's not too difficult to calculate, but it's difficult enough, and generally it only ends up being like less than one, maybe 2% of our total beam loading. So is it worth the hassle? Most people say no, and I can't disagree. So if we continue with our uh, example here and we start stacking beam on top of beam on top of beam on top of this, so we get you know something that's maybe three or four inches tall, and we keep bending it, we're gonna notice that the outer ones don't have that difference in radius as much as the ones right in the middle. And that makes sense. As you get further and further outside, the radius isn't gonna uh, cause as much uh, of the, the desire to slide. So the equation that we have for the transverse shear is uh, the shear stress is equal to VQ over IT. All right, let's take three of these right away. So V is gonna be the force that's applied right to the rollback preventer. Uh, and that could be actually quite large. Uh, Q we're gonna come back to. So I is the area moment of inertia and that for a rectangular shape is the width times the height cubed divided by 12. Uh, and that's just the property of any rectangular shape. And the uh, T variable in this equation will be equal to the width as well, the thickness right there. So Q is a little bit different. It's somewhat of a function and a uh, complicated one. So we can look at any height uh, along our section from the centroid up and then have the area moment of inertia, take that for above it and then adjust it forward with the parallel axis theorem to come down to the point that we're interested in. Uh, at some point, you can see that the maximum of most shapes, or most uh, at least uh, uniform shapes, like our rectangle here, uh, it would be highest at the centroid because that has the most area. And then as you get up, you have no area at the top, so our uh, Q would be zero, and, there, and therefore our transverse shear would also be zero. All right, now I don't want to get into the math here because it's complicated and it really doesn't help us and our solution does not require us doing any math. So if this transverse shear is causing us problems, how do we know when to actually use this? Well, there's three cases where we actually need to look at transverse shear. The first case is not applicable in this one and it's for a shape uh, such as an I-beam. In this case, you would have a wide flange at the top and bottom and a very thin web, that's the vertical member. 
uh, holding it together. So you have a lot of uh, sheer stress uh, in a very small amount of thickness. So that'd be the first case. And obviously since we have a rectangle, that's not applicable to our application. The other two are, uh, the next one is short stubby beams. If this is the definition of a short stubby beam where we have, you know, two to three inch moment arm when it rolls back and hits, uh, compared to a three and a half inch beam height, that's a short stubby beam. That's something that we desperately need to look at and make sure that uh, we are not violating the principles. The other case is when you have an anisentropic material. Now, that's a big word. Isentropic means the properties are the same in all directions. Uh, steel, aluminum, great materials for isentropic. Uh, you can pull on them in any direction and you get the same properties, roughly. I mean, on a very macroscopic level, you get the same properties. So wood definitely is an anisentropic material. The properties are not the same in every direction. In fact, we know this, if a tree falls across the road, we go get out our chainsaw, not our ax, and start cutting the length of the tree up in small sections. And then what do we do? We take it to a log splitter, we start splitting it against the end because we know the properties going this way and this way are not the same throughout the material. But it's very hard to cut it this way. So with using a short stubby beam and anisotropic method, these things are going to want us to slide against each other every time that is loaded up and since it is a shock load it's going to be even worse so the question is how do we fix this and the answer is actually uh, we're going to glue this back together and use it uh, but in addition to that we're going to put screws in here so we're going to have probably four or five screws along the length uh, most of them above um, the pivot section here uh, probably three screws above and one screw below because that's where all the shear is uh, and that way as uh, this thing will uh, be used the, the bolts the really strong screws will actually take all the load and allow us to have uh, our piece and be able to use it for a long time to come uh, using glue and screws well, thank you for watching this case study of uh, transverse shear and how it actually manifests itself in real world applications hey if you've made it this far please give us a like and uh you know, help us get the channel out to more people who might be interested in this technical nerdy stuff so thank you for watching and have a wonderful day